just some quick housekeeping over here. I'll be bringing some sponsors on board for Misfits very soon. Um, they will usually be at the start of the episode. So if you guys don't really enjoy or you guys heard of this before, you can just fast forward it. It'll be at the start and the end. And just like to ensure that every one of you guys who are listening that all the sponsors are products or services that can stand behind and I've tried. So if you guys have any uh, qualms or problem with any of these products or services, please, please, please bring it out. Uh, just uh, shoot an email to me and uh, I'll be notified. This podcast is brought to you by Altizen. If you don't know already, research is concluding that sitting all day is terrible for you. There's this new health phrase going on. It's called sitting is the new smoking. So if you're like me, I went to Ikea and tried one of those self-cranking desks and uh, I can just foresee that it's such a pain. So with Altizen, it has actually a motorized system in it that you put on your tabletop and transform your table into a standing desk. So and what's cool is that it's also intelligent. It tracks and actually coaches you to develop these new habits with a sense and the smartphone apps. Model starts at 1350 So check it out at altizen.com to see which might be the right fit for you. And if you decide to get one, you can code MISFITS to get a $400 off Altizen immediately. Uh, offer is limited to the first 10 customers. So just shoot them an email and code MISFITS. <laughs> Hey podcast listeners, welcome to episode 20 of Misfits. This is where I speak to the rebels, the outliers, the unconventionals of Singapore. Try to see things as how they see it and to learn from them. So some of these individuals include Gina Tao, who started an ice cream cart business and bought a BMW all under the age of 22, Dr. Loretta Chen, who is the consultant for the Kingdom of Bhutan, Adrian Pang, and a whole lot more. And today on the show, we have someone special. His name is Richard Chong. So he's not a Singaporean, but someone with amazing life experiences and lots of wisdoms to share. So he is actually one of my first couch shifting hosts in uh, Melbourne, and uh, he had opened me up to a, a whole new world so we became good friends and you know he even brought me to indoor skydiving in KL and I couldn't pass up this opportunity to interview him when he passed by Singapore so who is he so Richard retired from the Australian army at the peak of his military career as a paratrooper after more than 13 years of service uh, serving in deployments in several theater of conflicts around the globe uh, he is also a practitioner of several martial arts includes Krav Maga Silla Filipino martial arts, slacklining, and uh, body flying. So in this conversation, we spoke about uh, Richard's stories as a paratrooper in the Australian Army, how Richard became one of the person to, first person to be paid for a teaching slacklining in Melbourne, uh, self-defense advice for solo travelers, and much, much more. So without further ado... Well, thank you so much for taking out our time. You're welcome. I really wanted to interview you for a long time now. Um, and I guess when you start saying that you are coming to Singapore, I was like, oh, yes, let's do this. Um, because I think when I first started traveling, uh, you're my first host uh, for Couchsurfing in Australia. Um, I had a, uh, I mean, I wouldn't know how to describe it because I don't think one word could... Um, describe the entire of our uh, my experience with you I'm not sure about the other way around <laughs> um, you know it, it, it was just for me um, it was my first big trip out to Australia and it was full of excitement full of the unknown and uh, I just knew that okay well I'm gonna go to Melbourne and then there will be an Asian brother <laughs> gonna help me out uh, and, and, and there I go and, and the first thing I remember um, coming over to Australia Melbourne was like let's go dance I was like oh this is how fun and I just love it right so I, I, I actually uh, went out to do a little bit of digging on couch surfing and found our uh, reference no kidding <laughs> yeah and, and actually I think this is more a reflection on me than it is to you <laughs> let me just do a little bit of reading 
Yes, so um, here it goes. I would be wrong to categorize this human being with a list of adjectives because he is more than that. Rick lives his life surrounding in paradoxical belief, causing him to have multiple personality that's being squeezed into a human shell. What I'll say is that this human shell is a lot resemblance to Jet Li. <laughs> Not the Jet Li in the movie, but the Jet Li in real life. The one that get laid like a rock star. <laughs> Um, yeah, and what, whichever the case, uh, he's a character that you wouldn't want to miss out in your life movie. Well, thanks for a glowing report. That was uh, very flattering, I have to say. Thank you, Brian. I, I was cringing as, as I reread this because it, it really just shows where I am uh, in my life. But also, I'm, I'm really glad that sort of white-eyed, innocent Brian just looking at life full of excitement. Like I still am now. And I guess my question for you is that uh, on the other end, what do you feel of me? Because that was, that was almost seven years ago and I'm a di very different person now. Very good question. So when you, when you wrote me that request, you were the first ever Asian to have ever written me a request, uh, especially from Southeast Asia. Um, so I get literally at that time, easily on average between 50 to 80 requests a week. Uh, and I have to sift through all of them. And most of them are uh, European travelers, a lot of Americans, Canadians as well, uh, but primarily Europeans. And so when I got this message from this Asian brother fr from my parents' side of the world, that's like, dude, this guy's probably going to be just like me. And I got to say yes to him. And I do recall that uh, I am very selective about my request uh, uh, accept, uh, acceptance. So I, I do recall it was quite well written. And I thought, yep, he's coming to stay with me. So beyond that, I had no expectations. I just thought, uh, look, he's probably a young fella. He's probably going to be a little bit innocent and naive and a bit wet behind the nose, you know. Um, but beyond that, I just said, it's an open book. Let's see what, let, what, let's see what he can bring to the table. Yeah, and what were your parting thoughts of me after, I don't know, maybe, was it seven days? Because I stay with you for three days and then I, I live in another culture in the city uh, for three days as well, right? Uh, so I recall um, thinking, boy, this, this kid's so idealistic and so full of bullshit. When is he going to wake up to himself? But you got you to gotta understand at the time, I, I just literally came back from war service and I'm, I'm full of cynicism and I was a little bit uh, bitter about life, you know, and, but at the same time, very hopeful. And then I saw you just full of life and full of beans and, but at the same time, so full of idealistic um, concepts that were not real world ap applicable. So I thought this kid has got so much to learn, but you know what? I was, re I was really proud of you. Because despite a lot of the differences in the, uh, in the conversation that we had, uh, or at least differences in, in ideas, you were very receptive. And I thought, it doesn't matter where you go with your ideology, you're going to be a great listener, and you still are to this day, and you're going to be in a, a fantastic human being. Which you clearly are, because we're here right now, seven years <laughs> down the track. No, and you know, and, and you know what? You, what you just said remind me, reminded me of our conversations that we had. And I was just, and, and I think one of the moments I remember I was in uh, the car with you and, you and and I just thought to myself, this, this guy asks really weird questions. Like his flow of conversation is just so weird. Like it's just not conversational at all. And I think reflecting back, you were probably asking way better questions that are, not, uh, are unusual for a normal conversation, but those are like tough questions. I, I, I have to say, when you, uh, it's very cliche when you work in an environment where it's, you're consistently and constantly um, um, facing imminent danger. Uh, your own mortality kind of keeps popping up a lot in your, uh, in your own narrative, in your own head. So after a period, after a period of time, you, you kind of uh, practice immediacy. <laughs> Very, very well, you know, and, and this is actually a term that I've only recently just come, in, come to learn, but I've been practicing, practicing it for a, forever. When, when, you, you, when you're constantly um, placed in imminent danger, you have a very 
good reason to practice immediacy because you don't know if you will wake up the next day to go to work and you come back with all your limbs intact. Or worst case scenario, you don't come back at all. So, so the questions that I like to talk about and the things that I like to talk about are not your typical, hey, how are you doing? What do you do for work? You know, I mean, I still want to know what you do for work because while it doesn't define you, it tells me where you're at in life and we can kind of, it's a starting point from a, for a lot of conversations. However, I like to kind of just dive deep, fast, because this conversation I'm having with you might last five minutes or it might last five days or it might last five years. And if that conversation flows well, I will, this will last for five lifetimes for me. And, and you're right, Rick. I, I think I also sort of right now hold that taught with conversations these days. I bet back then too, um, but just with more naive ideology and now uh, just all going through the world a little bit older and wiser and seeing a bit more things. And these days I really like to dive deep and fast with conversations. You know, like uh, my favorite questions these days are, what are the challenges you're currently facing with? And, and how can I uh, help you out with that? Or what are, your, what are you passionate about? And sometimes if, if people really can't answer those questions, I get disinterested with the conversation. I, I totally get that, actually. I, funny you mention that because I, I had this very same conversation with a, a very dear friend of mine, which I, who I'm, whom I've known for quite a number of years as well. And I brought it up to her because I felt that there was some angst in her life. And that angst was present the last time I saw her, which was a few years ago. And that angst, the very same angst was present last time, uh, you know, when I saw her a few days ago. So I, I begged the question, what, what is it that's holding you back? You know, simple answer is fear. But, you know, it's not for me to dig deeper than that if they're not willing to share that, you know. Anyway, so that's, it's just interesting that we're no, having I this like conversation. That, no, I mean, I like that you, you, you probe too, because I think a lot of people is just too shy to, to just, you know, there's something with you, I'm not going to point it out but I'm going to ask a question to lead you there. It's a really difficult question to ask because it's, it's, a, it's a really big trap because if it's not received well, uh, that person's going to distance himself from you and you're going to be the douchebag conversationalist that they don't ever want to um, um, you know, see again. Um, so it's, it's a risky thing. But uh, once again, when it comes down to immediacy, I, I believe in gambling um, big because the rewards are big as well. Because if the person uh, that you're having this conversation with opens up to you, you know, um, it can go in so many different areas, so many different angles. And it's not my place to help anyone or give anyone advice because I'm not at all qualified to give anyone advice. However, if I can help you find your own answer within yourself, then, you know, cha-ching, you know, with yeah. uh, mission accomplished for that day. And, and, uh, no, and, and these days, I before have always uh, take the wrong angle, which is like, this is, this is the way and, and, and or the highway. But now I, I, I really enjoy that, you know, letting that person find their answer. Because if I were to tell you, like, my answer, you, like, maybe 90% of the time, I'm pretty sure that you would, you would not, like, register. Yeah, it's almost like you want to lead them uh, uh, to the place. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, I mean, uh, once again, it's one of those cliche a catchphrase. The answer is within us. No one needs to give us the answer, you know. Um, but sometimes it helps when someone kind of give you the right probing question for you to delve deep within, within yourself to find that answer, mm. to kind of challenge yourself to, to face some of those um, questions that you may not have the courage to ask yourself. So when you're, when you're walking down this path with some, somebody you trust in hand, you, know, you're, you might be more willing to address some of those issues. And that's what it, that's what it is that I try to, you know, or that's what I was trying to achieve. doesn't always work, however, but, you know. <laughs> No, I do the same too. So this, uh, this uh, interview is going to be a, a, a conversational parkour. Uh, lots of topic and we'll be all jumping around the place. Um, so maybe... I like it. Uh, let's just start with, you know, if someone would be on the street and would come up to you and ask you, what do you do? How would you answer that? Uh, that's a really tough question. But in a nutshell, I would say that um, I'm a connector of people. I, my gift to the world is I connect people uh, through various means. Um, sometimes it's as simple as saying, hey, Brian, this is my friend, Brian number two, okay? Or uh, I might uh, run a workshop 
and bring people together. I might uh, throw a random picnic and say, hey, random strangers, come and attend, and magic always happens, you know. And this is like, this is like a little catch, I love catchphrases, right? And, and this is one that I live by, build it and they will come. It started seven years ago, I, I, I built an NGO with a friend. In fact, no, but he asked me if, I, if, he, sh if he should build one. And I jokingly threw it out there, and it was, I believe it was from a movie. I don't even re recall what movie it came from, but uh, it says, build it and they will come. And I said it to him, dude, man, just go build it and they'll come. If you build it, I'm going to come and join you. And sure enough, he built it. And so I was like, I was like shit, <coughs> I'm in a poo now, so I guess I, I run an NGO now. So you know, we dived into it. But anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is um, um, I create opportunities for people to connect with one another. And that is my gift to the world. Yeah. And, and you yourself, like we, we mentioned before, uh, a Malaysian, Chinese-born Australian. And you're born in Australia, just to get it out of the way. Uh, no, actually, I was born in KL. Yeah. Uh, I was born in KL uh, in 75. And I was two years old when my, fa my family left the country to go to Brunei to work. So... Brunei being the Dubai of Asia, you know, that's where all the young people go to work and make lots of money and kind of go back to whatever country they come from. But um, yeah, we, my, I think my family were fairly progressive thinking and they decided very quickly that our uh, education and our, um, our future um, might be better enhanced if we had a, an overseas education, meaning you know, a Western education. So after their uh, mom and dad made a little bit of money, they went over to Australia where we just loved the lifestyle here, uh, there. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we just stayed. And when you're young, you know, you don't, you don't think about borders. You don't think about passports. You just know this is home. And so I, I bleed green and gold. And, you know, I, I am a, you know, uh, an Asian man living in, uh, in, uh, in Australia and very proudly so. And life has been very, very good to me in Australia. How old did you move over? I believe I was 11 years old at the time, yeah. Okay. And, you know, growing up as an Asian in a predominantly white country, uh, and, and Australia seems to also have a, a, a reputation too, um, do you uh, actually face any uh, racism of sorts while growing up? Funnily enough, not a lot. Um, but to clarify that, when, when, I, uh, when my family came to town, uh, we were some of the first Asian people in town. And I was the first Asian boy to ever attend that high school. So when, when um, my, my uncle, who's, uh, he's Caucasian, he married my, my dad's sister. Uh, he's a very big man and he's, you know, he's an outback farmer who sold his massive property. So he's got a little bit of money, right? So, so when we came to town, we were broke as hell. My dad borrowed this, a, a suit that belongs to my uncle. My mom bought this secondhand faux mink uh, uh, coat, and we were driving my uh, uncle's really expensive big car right up to the gate of the, uh, of the school, and they, mom and dad flanked me as we walked down the, the, um, the, the corridor to the principal's office to, to introduce me to the, you know, to the, uh, the faculty. And so the entire school, you know, full of white kids, kind of came out and looked at this Asian guy, you know, and so the rumor went around, um, went around uh, school that uh, the Yakuza was in town. So, you know, being the son of a, 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 a pretend gangster, and my dad kind of perpetuated that, uh, that myth with a really close shaved head. And my, my, my uncle also uh, owned a number of uh, pinball parlors, which again perpetuated that whole myth that we were gangsters. So... For the, my entire high school years, I never got bullied. Never once I got bullied. There was a lot of kind of snide comments, a lot of passive-aggressive uh, behaviors. I just couldn't understand why I never really got like, verbally abused when I saw other kids being abused. Completely uh, so you So you saw others? Like all the other kids get bullied, but I never got really, never got bullied. Wow. And then on the day we graduated high school, my best friend came to me and said, Hey, Rick, remember the day we, uh, you walked into school and your yeah, mom and dad's walking behind uh -huh. you? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It turns out that everyone thought you guys were the gangsters from Japan. We're, we're not even from Japan, right? So we're like, uh, I know, so that was a joke. Finally, you yeah, knew. So finally, I kind of dawned me. I said, right, okay, now I know why I never got in. But 
in, in addition to that, uh, I have to say, I was shocked when I first went to um, Melbourne shortly after that. Yeah. So I finished high school, I went to, you know, um, you know, further my education in Melbourne. And that's when I uh, encountered real racism. And it, it completely destroyed my faith in humanity. I was, I was scared for my life. And back in the 80s, um, there were like slogans spray painted on walls and it was very overt, you know, chinks go home. Uh, and Asians were the target of the month uh, at the time. So, you know, we, we, get, we, get, we get to take turns, you know. My Arab brothers are, are, are having a go at the moment, so I'm out of the, uh, the firing line. But um, as far as real uh, racism targeted at me personally, I have to say very little, very, very little. Uh, and I put it down to one of two things. First of all, I've been really lucky, I think. And secondly, I believe that I've got a, a strong enough personality that when I walk the street, uh, I, I dominate my space. And when you dominate your space, it is very unlikely that somebody with a low self-esteem is going to pick on you based on your skin color. Mm. Um, and, and when someone does throw one of these um, comments out there, like, well, a racial comment, for instance, um, it isn't always about racism. Sometimes it's just an ignorant comment um, that, they don't, that they, they don't even know is a, a racist comment until you can educate them on it. So I'm very cautious about um, picking, calling people out on racism, quote unquote, um, unless you are overtly racist, I, I will not necessarily jump down your throat for it. However, if you are, God help you because I will not. Yeah, yeah I because you know, I, re I remember that going to Australia, people say it is like a racist country. Yes. I was there six weeks, no problem. I'm having a good time. Exactly. And once again, it comes down to a personality. You know, when, when, you, when you have a bright personality, you, you attract nothing but brightness. You know? When you walk the street with a frown in your head expecting to you know, be fun, that's exactly what you'll find. You know? um, so I, I guess this is, a lot of it comes down to the type of person that you are. If you live in fear, as a lot of my Asian brothers do, that's exactly what they find. They will find people who will target them because they live their, their entire body language screams pick on me i think i mean even to add on to that i will also think that is sort of a a narrative that they are telling themselves like they are trying to look for racist thing that other well if i were to go in to think that you know the world is nice the world is awesome and the world generally would be awesome <laughs> yeah that's how interesting yeah no because it was it was really different comments when i asked people about the australia experience yeah. versus mine and i was just like wow interesting you know Okay, so moving along, you end up in the army. <laughs> and I wouldn't think that Australia have a, a mandatory mandate that you need to go to the army. So what are the sequence of events that um, lead you to uh, joining the force? Well, you know, some people are born to be a doctor. Some people are born to be healers. Some people are born to be teachers. I, was, I believe I was born to be a, a, a warrior. Um, I'm just gonna let this plane go past. A lot of planes today. Yes, there's a lot of planes today. The Air Force are doing the exercise apparently. Mm. Um, so from a very young age, my, my earliest memory I recall uh, was when I was, I've got a fantastic long-term memory. <laughs> it's, I've got memory all the way back to two years old, I believe. Um, and I've got this very vivid um, memory of myself when I was two and a half years old um, in KL. Mm. And I was in this shared house with my where my parents lived with a whole bunch of other people. And we had this black and white TV downstairs. And back in the old days, black and white is, is, is like, you know, poor people TV. So we put this blue film over the screen so that you've got a bit of color, right? And that's how, that's how you get t uh, color TV back in the old days. So anyway, there was this uh, scene. I, don't, I didn't know this um, movie until many, many, many years later. And there was a war movie where a group of soldiers had fought very hard um, against another group of soldiers. And at the end of the battle, they climbed the, to the top of a feature and the five soldiers were pushing his flag up against the, the, the highest point of the feature. And that image kind of burnt itself into my psyche. And I, and I, I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to be that. I'm going to do that one day. I, I remember so clearly, I'm going to do that one day. And, and so that, that kind of planted the seed um, for what I was meant to, uh, what I would do eventually, you know, uh, many, many years after that. 
Um, so I told the line, I did what the, you know, what, what an Asian son is expected to do. I'm the oldest son in the family, you know, that my, my dad would have expected me to be an engineer like him. And so, you know, um, I bucked the system a little bit. I, I became a, um, you know, a, uh, a geek. I, I studied applied science and information technology. Oh, wow. Um, and after my studies, I, I knew. Yeah, right. Um, so I did, I, I finished my studies and I said to my parents, I've completed my obligations to my family but I now need to live my own life. And I decided to uh, apply for officer training. And with the full support of my family, they, they were very supportive. I thought, they thought, all right, my son's going to be an officer. That's okay. No worries, we can do this. We can deal with this. And so I went through the, to the second round of interviews and, um, um, and something dawned on me. I'm a brown-skinned soldier walking into a white man's army. And I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to generate um, respect if I don't even know what soldiering is? How are they going to understand um, what I need them to do if I don't know the hardship that they go through? So I very quickly, you know, I got to the interview, I excused myself and I said, I'm re um, redrawing my, um, withdrawing my application. And they asked me why and I told them exactly why. So I said, yep, no worries. Chop, here you go. General enlistment. Uh, goes to this officer the next day and within, I think within, um, within six months, uh, they've done all the checks uh, required of me and um, I was into boot camp and thus begin the journey of um, my soldiering life. Oh, wow. So you, you have the opportunity because you did the uni yeah. to be able to be an officer. At the last minute, I pulled out to be a grunt. Wow. It's not even like, well, I don't want to be in the army altogether. But it's like, no, I want to start from the lowest level. The lowest denominator, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I think, Rick, why the hell did you do that? That was, that was so many years of agony and pain and unnecessary bullshit. But um, as it all turned out, it, you know, on one, I, I don't know if I would do things any differently, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's, it's made me the man I am. However, however cynical I am these days, but you know, it's, it's made me who I am. And I feel that this is what I'm meant to, what I'm meant to have done. So I, I think it was a good decision. And, and if, I'm, if I didn't get this wrong, is, uh, you, you left as a paratrooper? Yes, that's right. I, I, I was always a paratrooper. So back in the old days, when, when, I, when I went to boot camp, right, um, I excelled at what I did because I, when, I, when I signed on a dotted line, I wasn't there because I had no other options. I, I was there because I, I literally bought the bullshit of for queen and country, for the flag, for the soil, you know, for, the, for the ones who die before you and for the brothers next to you. I really sucked it all in. And I still do, believe it or not. I still, I still believe in it, true and true, balls to bones. Um, but I'm now a little bit more cynical and I believe that I'm, I'm a bit more wiser. But at the time, I decided when I, um, when I was going to be a soldier and a grunt that I would give my life to it. So when I signed on the dotted line, it was actually a very significant symbolic gesture of myself giving my entire life to my country. And in doing so, I, you know, when you give yourself so fully, so wholeheartedly, there's nothing you cannot do in, in, uh, in this world. You become an expert at everything. You become an expert at becoming an expert. So I excelled at my uh, at uh, at boot camp, which isn't hard, by the way. You know, it's people think boot camp is like, oh my god, you know, it's it's it was literally the easiest thing I've ever done in my, in my life. But up to that point, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, I thought, oh my god, nothing will ever be harder than this. But little did I know, holy hell, that was, it just got like a million times harder than that. So I excelled at boot camp, um, and I went. Um, I, I chose to be infantry. I, I could have gone in, in, in any stream at the time. Um, so I, I selected infantry and I said, yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, because nobody wants infantry because you are like the lowest common de de denominator. Yeah. And, and just, just so pe for, for people uh, who are listening, um, what, what, how would you describe a paratrooper? Because I was on Wikipedia and it's like, yeah, basically a, a trooper that can do the parachute thing. I was like, all right. It's, there's not much more to it. I mean, like, um, but this is also the highest one, the highest. We are an elite unit. We are an elite unit. So we are a group of um, 
very special group of men with very dedicated um, sense of duty. But what differentiates us from other soldiers is our mode of transport, which is travel in style. That's all. That's, that's how I like to look at it. Um, you know, when you talk about things like elite units, special forces, um, you know, it's potato potato. It's, it's all semantics. At the end of the day, we all do a job and we all uh, either excel at it or we die. Or, or worse yet, our brothers die. Um, and that's all there is to it. So as far as the, uh, what the paratroopers, it's, it's basically, um, you know, the, the ground troops, the shock troops who, who dominate a, a, a battle space from the sky. So, you know, you can uh, have Marines who come from the ocean um, and, and paratroopers, that, well, my guys do, uh, we dominate the airspace. So anything that to, to do with the sky, you know, um, kilo insertions, um, parachuting, um, halo jumps, hey ho jumps, uh, anything to do with parachute R&Ds, uh, it falls under our domain. And I'm going to ask a very stupid question here, <laughs> which is... Um, so in, in, in the U.S., you have like Navy SEALs and, and they are like so-and-so. Uh, and, and what is the paratrooper of the Australian Army? Like where, where would you place them or how? Uh, my, my unit where I um, uh, finished up uh, was is part of uh, what we call a Special Forces Training, Center, uh, training, um, training Wing. Um, so we, we uh, are pretty much in charge of the the training, R&D, and everything associated with the Special Forces community um, uh, operation and support of that operation. So when they go into operation, for instance, we go in with them to support them in, in, their, in their whatever it is they do. Um, oftentimes when we're not doing that, we're just like any other uh, um, soldiers doing what other soldiers are doing, patrolling the, the battlefield, uh, patrolling the cities that we have um, occupied. Um, uh, providing and, and that's not all we do. We also do a lot of things like uh, disaster relief. My first ever live operation was actually um, my first week into my unit. Walked in, you know, I thought I was tough shit. I was a paratrooper. I walked in with my chest puffed out, oof, you know. And little did I know, my first op was going to be um, uh, cutting trees. <laughs> it was. It, it turned out to be the the hottest year in the history of uh, Australian. And are we talking about cutting tree with an X or is it like electrical? Anything. Uh, none of us were, were qualified in chainsaws, but they threw a chainsaw in their hands and said, go cut. Now go cut a fire trail. Because <laughs> this, we had an area in, in New South Wales where the entire forest was just being devastated by yep. this massive um, out of control fire. And they threw everything they had at it. And so they, caught, they had reserve soldiers evacuating um, civilians. They had us uh, cutting a massive fire trail between the fire and the next um, uh, state forest. And so that was my first live op. You know, I thought I'd be jumping in with guns blazing, you know, and popping out of the water with face painted, you know. Nope, I was uh, chopping trees down okay. and raking a fire trail. <laughs> And you know, I remember going with you to an, an, an exact day, yeah, and, um, and you were dressed in your parade uniform, and comparing to the rest of the other people, uh, your uniform seems to be a lot heavier <laughs> with all the badges. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about some of these badges that you've acquired. Uh, what are some of the more interesting ones? Uh, well, we have, a lot of, um, we have a lot of embellishments on our, on our coats or our jackets. Um, uh, some of the things you would have seen on my coat would be uh, my return serviceman's coat uh, um, badge, which tells, I guess, the rest of the world that uh, I'm somebody who has served the country on operations and have returned alive. Um, you would have seen a, 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 thank you, an infantry combat badge, which is perhaps the biggest badge of honor that you can um, bestow upon a, uh, an infantry troop. And as this is only... Um, bestowed upon somebody who's been in combat. So that kind of differentiates you from somebody who's been in, on operations but never actually been in combat. So, you know, there's a lot of times when you do go into a, a theater of conflict and you never hear a single shot fired. You know, you're, and that's, that's perfectly fine. And it's, it's, you know, this, this is exactly what we want. We don't go into someone's backyard picking a fight. However, sometimes that does happen. And, you know, um, as an infantryman and as a paratrooper, you, if you don't... Um, pitch your skills against an opponent that is likewise trained like you are. It's like training for a, a, a soccer match or the grand final that you never ever get to play. And you live your entire life thinking, was I ever good enough? 
what would I would I have survived combat? Would I have survived the stress of combat? You know, would I have frozen uh, when the time counted, counted? And these are the big questions a lot of people I will, will thankfully never get to answer. Uh, and you know, and I think it's a fantastic thing that they don't have, ever have to answer that. Um, but my my troops and I, my we we've served in three different conflicts um, up to the point I, I left the service and. So those badges and those medals are reflected the different campaigns that I've been involved in. And I'd just like to underscore something that um, the U.S. and Australia are allies. Yes, um, so, which means that, I mean, with, I think what you told me was that every war after the Vietnam War. Exactly. So every war after the Vietnam, uh, well, since the Vietnam War, it, no, even before, prior to that, uh, uh, the Korean War, um, we were we were embedded with Americans and the Canadians. Uh, Vietnam War, we were embedded with Americans again, and every war since then, the American has been involved in. We've been in, uh, we've been up to our necks um, in the shit with them as well, yeah, so to speak. In our conversation yesterday, you brought up about moving a three wheel lorry up a mountain. Yes. <laughs> tell tell me more about that. Well, uh, we. <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, people think soldiering is, is all about blowing shit up and falling out of planes and very, you know, very cool stuff. And it is, a lot of it is. Um, the other part of it is they, they kind of, they, they, they make you into amazing creative inventors of things. Um, some of the most amazing things that come out of the battlefield were, you know, were because of what we do. And so it, one of the things, the, the, the to, in relation to what you're talking about, we had a situation where we were bringing aid uh, in a truck. And it was a pretty old truck, and the truck had lost its wheel. So my, my, my team and I had to move this fully laden truck uh, with three wheels up a really steep incline. And it was a logistical religious, nightmare. And well, we managed to get it up the hill, let's put in, in short. Well, I want to know how you do it. <laughs> Uh, we, we had to cut down uh, a number of trees. Um, we were really Wait, good so at lashing. What, 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 which wheel was this? It was the, let me think, it was quite a while ago. It was the rear re left, re left wheel. Okay. Yeah. So we, we had one guy in the, in the cab uh, pumping the brakes every time we needed him to kind of stop it from rolling back on us. And um, <laughs> we, we rigged up this system where we basically, the entire team was basically carrying the weight and the load of the, the broken wheel. With um, with a um, a lever, and Ooh. and because um, uh, the the drivetrain was still operational, but damaged, we couldn't uh, we couldn't work the wheel. So we had to get half the team pushing this damn thing up the tr up the hill while the rest of us were supporting it. Um, so I had I was one of the uh, support, and uh, during that uh, particular operation, I crushed my spine. And what? To which I'm still, uh, to which I'm still suffering from today. Um, so I've got back, terrible back pain from that. And yeah, but you know, um, it makes us wonderful creative inventors of things. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just. I'm going to dive into something a bit like uh, deeper and darker a little bit. This question. So, um, in the forces, I guess uh, this question is more for like how maybe it's a two-part question. How do people cope with the loss of a, uh, a, a another dear soldier in the force, and how do you cope with it? Good question. I'm gonna take a moment to pause for a sec. Yes. This question always um, takes me places. Yeah, um, we can come back to it. How about that? It's fine. It's um, while, while it's kind of fresh in my mind, I like to just knock on a head. On a head. And I think this is something I'd like to share with um, with the general public as well. Oh, the first time I witnessed um, a, a fatality was actually back in Australia. Uh, we were making preparations for deployment, and uh, it was a brigade um, brigade size operation. And so, you know, um, part of the um, 
part of what we do as paratroopers is we are really good at adapting our mode of operation. So yes, we dominate the sky and dominate the battlefield, but we also become experts at other modes of um, insertion. On this particular operation, we were um, working with um, heavy armor and armored uh, transport vehicles. So we were basically inserting um, with uh, what what we call ASLAVs, which are six-wheeled armored vehicles. They are effectively a light armored tank that can go on pretty much any type of terrain uh, where the, the crew commander uh, can sit outside of uh, his hatch uh, to, have a battle, uh, to have a good view of the battlefield when he's not under fire. His driver sits next to him um, uh, under cover inside, inside a covered um, um, enclosed capsule. On this particular convoy, um, we were returning from particularly difficult exercise, and the driver had lost control of the of the, the Aslav, and it rolled down an embankment. I was in a vehicle directly behind um, that um, uh, disabled uh, that down vehicle, so we were the first responders, and the. The vehicle had rolled on top of the crew commander, but he was just, um, his, his chest was outside of um, the vehicle. Up to his, um, this is probably a bit gruesome. I don't know if you can, if you, might, if you may want to edit this, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Go for it. Um, he was completely lucid, and he said to, he said to, to us that he needed the phone. Um, he needed to call his wife. It was fatal. Uh, <clears throat> he got his last call. He got his last call, and uh, we told him that the second we lift the vehicle off his chest, he would die from blood poisoning. Basically, um, the toxin would rush from his uh, lower extremities straight to his heart and and into his brains, and that's exactly what happened. So we waited for the longest time while we listened to this horrible, uh, heartbreaking conversation. And some of us held his hands and waited for the... Uh, I can see it must be a really tough decision for everyone it was, over there too. It was. Because it's more of a situation where you know that in any moment, if you lift it up, he's going to end his yeah. life. But yet, you know, you don't want to let him suffer in pain any longer. It's the hardest decision to to make the call. It's not my decision, obviously, to make. I was, I was a, um, I was just a, um, a private at the time. The call came from the highest uh, level, and you know, when it came, we were there to to see him go, and that was um, that was difficult. But at the time, we we did what any soldiers did. Uh, you know, we drank to his honor, we drank to his um, family, and we made a collection for his family, and it was full of bravado and, and loud uh, cheering, and, and we toast to any battle gods that would listen to us, you know, uh, to hide and mask our own fear of, uh, for our own mortality. That could mm. have been any of us. Did that work? Yeah, it did, believe it or not. It did. To, to an extent. We mastered and we hid our, our true emotions. And that was how I learned to deal with subsequent uh, loss of friends throughout the years. Um, Correct me on what, if I'm wrong, and you don't drink now? No, I don't. No. I drank like a fish when I, was, um, when I first joined the army, but um, very shortly after that, I, I, I gave up and I made a vow never to drink again. And to this day, I've never drank a drop. Um, yeah, so that's that's one way we dealt with it. Myself personally, uh, I deal with it a little bit more pragmatically. So I have a very strong spiritual background. I'm a my family's a Buddhist. I'm a Buddhist. It it clashed um, terribly with with what I did for a living. 
Um, and this was a struggle that I had fought for for many, many years. And I, I've always, I would always return to my master, my Buddhist master, and I would ask him, have I made the wrong decision? You know, uh, am I doing the wrong thing? To which he would always answer the, with, the same answer, uh, with the same response. Do it with the right intention in your heart, with no anger in your heart, and you will be fine. So I, I took that to heart, and whatever I've done from that day on to, to now, I, I do it with no malice in my heart. When I have to hurt somebody um, in the line of duty, I do it with absolutely no malice in my heart. With the exception of a few times when I lost my shit, I lost my cool. Um, I have to say those were not my finest moments. But yes, uh, I always try and keep those kind of um, little lessons in my heart. Yeah, and I think this is a perfect uh, segue um, for how you were as forced for almost 12 years. And, you know, what were the decisions or, or sequence of events that led you to leave the force? Oh, wow. That was probably the simplest, but at the same time, the most difficult uh, decisions of my life. Joining, I thought, was a hard decision because I was full of fear of the unknown. But leaving, I was full of fear of the known. I knew that I would be going back to the default world. I, would, I was going back to mediocrity. When I was in uniform, or when I was in the service, rather, because we we're not always in uniform, um, when, was, when I was in the service, I'm not ordinary Joe. I'm beyond that. I'm, I'm beyond Superman. Um, it is amazing what you, what, what you kind of, the narrative that goes through your mind when you, when you have to put yourself in that position. We, we consider ourselves dangerous men. We consider ourselves special people, you know, in a very special kind of environment among very um, 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 among like-minded people. And what uh, one of the, the difficult um, things for me was um, knowing that I'd be losing not just my payroll, but I'm losing my brotherhood. I'm losing my family. Because the payroll is at least... Of your concerns, that was least my concerns. I wasn't worried about money. I, I'd, I'd, I'd always known that I'd be okay financially, one way or another. I'd always be okay. But um, yeah, L losing the chunk of my life, losing my family, that chosen family, that weird bunch of dickheads that I would never introduce to my family, type of family, um, was it filled me with absolute terror. And to, to, to know that I'll no longer be special, no longer wear that badge that says that when, when we are in uniform, everyone knows who we are because of the color of our beret. You know, we, we stand out. It is in the international colors of paratroopers. And, and you know, it's, it's very hard, I guess, for people to understand who has, hasn't walked, the, walked, that, walked the line that a piece of material, the color of a piece of material can give you so much identity, but it did. It gave me strength. It gave me um, the will to persevere through all manners of hardship, both emotional, physical. Um, I, I have smashed through pain barriers I never thought possible, all because of a piece of material, the color of a piece of material. You know, because somebody told me that this piece of material will make you invincible when I put it on your head, on your head. And why then the thought even first, you know, that you maybe want to leave? Um, I was uh, coming to the end of my military career and I was uh, physically broken. I, I had suffered a, a great deal of injuries. Um, uh, we talked about the crush spine with the truck. That Ooh. was probably the, the least um, severe of the injuries. Just the least? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, wow. I, I fell out of a plane once. Um, uh, that was that was quite severe. Uh, I had amnesia for a week. Um, that's another funny story. That it, it was literally like um, an episode out of a movie. I woke up uh, on the ground, looking up at the sky, thinking, "Where the hell am I? I'm wearing all these funny clothes that looks the same. That's the colors of the ground. 
I've got this rifle sitting next to me. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I didn't know it was a rifle, but I knew I had to do all these things with it. Okay, cool. I, I, but I, and I knew I got to keep it with me. And I saw all this material flopping above, behind me. I didn't know it was a parachute, but I knew I had to pack it like this. I knew I had to stow it like this. And I knew I had to carry it with me and then stash it somewhere. I don't know why, but I knew I had to do it. And I knew I had to be 15 kilometers in that direction. I don't know why, but off I go. So that's start trotting in the correct direction. Got to my destination. I don't know why I need to be here, but I know I need to be really quiet when I get here. Okay. So I cached myself, you know, I hid myself. And eventually I saw somebody kind of dressed like me. I thought, look, if he's dressed like me, maybe he's a friend of mine. Right. I whispered to him, comes over to me and he stows his key. And I've, I've got a bit of a headache, so I kind of elbowed him and said, do I know you? He goes, yeah. Continues with his um, stowing of his gear. And he goes, and I said to him again, do you know me? And he goes to me, Sparrow, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know who you are. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, but I just know I need to be here. And so he kind of sat me down and said, relax. I'm going to look after you. So he jumps on the radio. Hilo comes and picks me up. And anyway, long story short, um, it was about a week before the memory came, came back. And yeah, I got shipped back home, obviously, very quickly. And yeah, so the memory came back. And, but I've got this massive gap in my um, memory bank. I've got uh, no recollection of the incident itself. My, my, um, my reserve ship deployed on its own. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the injuries oh, wow. I had suffered. Yeah. Among others, my knees are shot. Um, my spine's... Uh, no one we have knew. You look so healthy. Oh, yeah. Look, uh, I'm in constant pain. But the, pro the thing is, the problem with complaining is, you just piss people off. So I, I've decided not to and just smile through it. Sometimes you forget you have pain, but uh, every so often it will remind you. Some days I will crawl on the ground crying from the pain. And the person who sees all this is my wife. She is the one who, who gets to witness all the, um, the fallout of all this um, anecdotes that I get to share with you today. Yeah. And so, mainly it was the health that made you want to, would you say so? No. Uh, that was a great part of it, I have to say, yes. That was, mm -hmm. I would say maybe about 60, 70% of it. The, the other thing that kind of sealed the deal for me was the fact that we were fighting in conflicts that I no longer believed in. We were, I was, I'm a thinker. I'm, I'm, I'm a philosopher, and I'm also a warrior. I just happen to get paid for what I, what I, what I believe is I'm doing right. So in the early days, when I was deployed for the first few times, I truly believed in, in, in what we were doing. But towards the end of my deployment, you know, uh, and I won't talk about where, where mm. I go, but towards the end of my deployment, I, I feel that you know, it's a profit game now. It's no longer about helping people. It's no longer about assisting um, our, our less fortunate brothers and sisters who, who are doing it tough under the, the, um, uh, under the leadership of a dictator. Um, it's no longer about that. Yeah. So, on top of that, um, when I started questioning things, I found that um, the establishment do not like soldiers who question orders. They don't like soldiers who think too much. They do want you to think critically on operational matters, matters, but not political matters. So when, you, when I start having this kind of discussion over the mess, mess hall, um, people take note. I no longer receive the kind of um, accolade that I would normally get from my, from my superiors. You know. They started to shun me and kind of uh, sideline me. You know, they, they didn't want me to influence the younger soldiers. Um, and I was getting quite old at the time as well. So, you know, I, I have a group of guys. I, have more, my, I had my own team. Yep. And obviously, you know, whatever uh, your team, uh, the team leader dis, uh, talks about, it's what the younger soldiers will, will contemplate. And that, that will perpetuate that whole, you know, cycle. So, obviously, um, my uppers didn't appreciate that. And they've told me that in so many words as well. But I, I wasn't going to be cowered by you know, my superiors, so mm -hmm. I kept challenging them, you know, um, because I didn't understand myself. So I found that they kept pushing me further and further back down the line, and to the point where they decided the only way they're going to shut me up 
was to give it the best posting in the entire army, uh, to which I was very grateful. <laughs> but, but I recognized exactly what it was. It was a, a severance pay. They, they were saying, you've had enough. We need to put you out to pasture now. Um, and that was basically what they did. They, they sold me out. And you didn't, so hence, you actually didn't leave willingly. Um, would I have stayed on uh, if things were different? Yes, yes. Um, had any one of those factors not been uh, at play, I think I'd probably still be in uniform uh, one, in one form or another. But um, given what it is what it is, here I am having a conversation with you. No, and, and this really uh, actually is a good segue to the next thing we're talking about, which is a soldier and a warrior. Maybe you'd like to uh, tell me more a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, I, I used to think they were the one and the same, you know, a soldier is a warrior. Warrior is a soldier, right? It ain't. It isn't. Far from it. A soldier is somebody who is paid. It's a profession. You are paid to go to war for a nation. A warrior, on the other hand, is somebody who takes on a cause, be it social, be it, um, be it um, environmental. Um, it could be anything. Um, somebody who has decided to put his life on the line for his community rather than for a, pay, for a pay, paycheck. That is, uh, in a nutshell, the big difference between a soldier and a warrior. So to this day and to the day that I die, I will say that I am a warrior. I walk the, the warrior's path. And, but I will never, ever identify myself as a soldier ever again. Not to say that I'm not proud of what I have achieved as a soldier in that time that I was. Hmm. And, and I think there's a lot of narrative that, that, that you walk through in, while you're there and, and you had to sort of unlearn. I mean, if you were to, and we talk about questions, right? If you were to give a question to people who are still in the force, so let them sort of think on it. Uh, what, what would that question be? And to just sort of like challenge them on the notion of the narrative they're telling themselves. As, as in why they're joining the army? Well, yeah, I think why being a... a why, why be a soldier? Yeah, being a, a, a good... Mm -hmm. uh, what was the most important question, really? I often ask this actually because a lot of people would come to me um, to seek advice as they're joining uh, the forces or those who are in the force who wants to uh, go for selection for special forces training. Uh, they would come to me to um, get advice about how to, um, you know, um, how, how to get the foot in. I guess the question I, I, I often ask them is what is it that you choose, what, what is it that you hope to achieve? by playing at that elite level. Why, what is the difference between where you are now and, and, and where you choose to be? And the answer often is quite varied. Sometimes it's quite naive. Uh, sometimes it's just, uh, I want to be better than myself. And, and as far as I'm concerned, your, your answer is yours. So, you know, I, I'm not here to judge what your answers are. But I will always give them the, the best um, description of my, um, my time in the service. Mm -hmm and what it cost me personally mm. to, to be playing at that elite level. Um, it's, it comes at a tremendous cost, um, not just physically, but um, socially you have no friends. You have a family and you don't have a job. You have, you have your unit. You know, we don't go to work. I have not worked a single day in my life as far as I'm concerned. Um, you cannot make friends with civilians because they will, never, they will never understand you. You will never relate to women in the way that they deserve to be related to. It makes you a misogynistic, sexist pig, like people that, that I despise, that I, that I personally um, buck against. You know? um, it makes you a racist. Um, it's crazy, but uh, you know, I, 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 I will put my hand on my, on my heart and say I once behaved like a racist pig. Um, but I like to think that I know better now. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, cost, it comes at a great cost. It cost me a marriage. It cost me um, my home. 
two homes, in fact, two homes. So I, I always tell people who come to me asking for those kind of advice or those kind of um, uh, discussions, are you willing to give up your entire life for this pursuit? Because if you're not, or if you're not even, if you even have an inkling of doubt in your mind that you're not willing to give up all these things, then the answer is no, you don't, you don't need to be here. You don't want to be here. And tell me the, about the day when, when you left the force. How, how was the day like? Very bitter. I, I felt betrayed. I was broken. I was spiritually broken. I was um, mentally drained. I was emotionally drained. Uh, physically, when you look at me, I was at the peak of my fighting, um, fighting form. I was, I'm really short. I, I don't know if the camera can pick it up. I'm, a, I'm, a really, I'm the smallest guy in my unit, um, full of alpha characters, big dogs in my units, and I mean big. Um, at my fighting fitness, at my fighting weight, I was 80 kilograms, and that is unheard of for somebody my size. So physically, when you look at me, you think he's at the top of his game. But inside, I was completely broken. I was, um, I was shattered. There was nothing left in me. I had no steam left in me. I had no more passion left in me. Um, I've just lost my family. So going back to my family, mom and dad, my then wife, um, it just felt hollow and tasteless. Like they were second best. And they, they don't deserve that. They don't deserve that label. But I, that's exactly how I saw them. My family was second best. And I told them that. So you will never measure up to the family that I, that I, um, that I earned for myself. And how arrogant was I to even think that, you know, to let alone say it. Um, so it was a very bitter day. I left the service knowing that uh, things will never be the same, you know. And I don't know if you're willing to share about this, but, you know, looking back, you know, what do you, because you, you mentioned a little bit about depression, um, being um, suicidal, homicidal. And I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but please just correct me if I'm... Absolutely. Yep, and also it causes the loss of your home and your marriage. What do you think attribute to you being in depression? Um, or what are the few, you know, I don't know, could you say factors, narrative, points, however you want to put it? A lot of it, uh, it, it was, we, we won't mince uh, words, it is exactly what it was. It was post-traumatic stress disorder, combat stress in other words. Um, there, there were very, some very specific incidences that, that, that would trigger that. When I think about it, you know, it would send me in a really steep spiral downwards. Um, but at the time, I didn't know this. I, in fact, I, I had completely forgotten about this incident. I had buried it in, my, in my, the back of my, of my mind. Um, but at the time, when I left the service, uh, a broken man, I didn't know I was broken. I just knew that I was sad. But it was a legitimate sadness because I was leaving something that I'd known all, as far as I was concerned, all my life, right? So I thought that is that, that's exactly what I was sad about. But this sadness, this depression dragged on for months and months. Now, this is not normal. There's nothing in life um, was, was fun anymore. You know, my wife, who is a, my ex-wife rather, uh, was a wonderful woman who, she saved my life, in fact, her and her father. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, they they couldn't understand. They, they knew exactly what was wrong with me because. Um, so let's let's uh, let's go back. When I was married to this lady, um, she her father was a, an ex soldier from my unit. So when I was introduced to him uh, upon a, 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 a meeting her, mm -hmm. he welcomed me into the home and accepted me as you know, the future son-in-law that he knew that I would be. And when, I, when you're accepted by somebody like that, who's, it, it's an amazing honor. You know, he's a war hero. He's a decorated soldier. And he's the highest decorated uh, firefighter in, in New South Wales at the time. And so one day he came up to me, he puts his hand on my shoulders and he says, Rick, um, you may not want to hear this, but you have what they call post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. 
And I looked at it and said, what? What's this PTSD bullshit? Never, I haven't heard of it at that point. So I was very cynical and I said, this is mumbo jumbo rubbish, right? Um, it's for soft, bloody soft hearted, tissue crying liberals, you know, and which I'm not. Apparently I am. Anyway, um, so I, I kind of rejected his, uh, his assessment. Um, and at the time, all I knew was I was either very, very sad, very depressed, or I was incredibly angry. The kind of rage that I cannot explain, um, where I would just destroy the entire house. I would throw things, I would throw the television on the ground, that kind of rage, for no reason. I couldn't understand it. And I was hypervigilant. Um, and so when he, when he mentioned that, I realized that, okay, maybe there's something not quite right with me, but you know what? No big deal. I get over this, right? I'll get over this. I'm a paratrooper. There's nothing I cannot do, right? Yes. That's exactly what I was, that is exactly the narrative I had in my mind. I'm a paratrooper. There's nothing I cannot do. The arrogance of me. Wow. And it came, all came to a head one evening when, um, so my, my, my then wife, my ex-wife and I owned an apartment in Sydney and we were the youngest owners of the co apartment complex, um, of the apartment in that complex. Mm -hmm. And my wife was uh, part of the body corporate committee and she would attend the meetings and she'd come home crying after every single meeting. And one day I lost my nuts. Um, so I found out that she was being bullied by the, um, the chairperson who is, um, he's a, he's a bully. He's known as a bully. And I lost my nut. I said, how fucking dare you? You have no idea who I am. I picked up the hammer with the intention of um, murdering him in his, in, his, in, his own, his, in his own house. I got to his door. I kicked his door down. Um, and my, my wife, my, my ex-wife was begging me, begging me to, she, she practically kneeled down for me. She said, don't cross the threshold. Because if you do, there will be no turning back. And, um, and then my father-in-law, thank God, bless him, he was there at the time visiting with his daughter and me. He, he appeared behind me. He puts his hand on my shoulder while I was raging with a hammer, about to go full postal on his man. He puts his hand on my shoulders and he says, Rick, it's okay. I understand. So I look at him in his eyes and he looks at me. He says again, I understand. I get it. And that's all he said. And I just broke down crying. I dropped the hammer and I said, what is, what's happening to me? What is happening to me? I said, this, this rage is not normal. And that's when I said to them, I, I will accept help. I will go to a cycle. Uh, I get psychological analysis, analyze and whatever else. <laughs> And I would actually commit myself into a hospital if I need to. Yeah. So I did for, um, I thought it would be for about, um, you know, six days a week, seven, maybe two weeks. I ended up being incarcerated and I wasn't incarceration. What, what, can you, what, what do you mean? Like, do you get tied up? Uh, no, no, it wasn't one of those type of places. But I, I was uh, locked up at a, at, at a nut house for uh, almost six months. Six months, yeah. It was the, some of the hardest things I've had to, ever had to face. But at the same time, it was also the start of my, my uh, recovery. You know, it, it, it gave me a lot of skills to deal with the, the stress that comes up, uh, that, that surface, you know. And, and it's not all doom. Like, you know, we've talked a lot about the doom and gloom of, of, of service life. And mm. there's a lot of it. But on the other side of the flip side of the coin, there's a lot of positive that comes out of it, you know, mm. like, it's amazing, like, you know, the, the life skills I've learned from this nut house saved my life. And believe it or not, it's, it's helped a lot of other people that I've come in contact with throughout the years. One of whom is my best mate, who, who also was in the army that served with me. I, I you know, um, I was able to use some of those skills to help him uh, cope with his stress. So, you know, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean... Of course. I mean, I think which, which is why I love this kind of interview because it's long. You can just talk about anything you want. And I think that's kind of like how life is, right? There's uh, two sides of the coin. And, and, and if you just give the person three minutes, what can they tell you in three minutes? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad uh, six months was <laughs> over for you. And uh, but it's, 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 it's so long. Six months is... Yeah, man. It's really long. Yeah. 
but it was really, I mean, like I, I say incarceration, it was incarceration, but uh, it was like a, a country club, to be honest. You know, it was, oh. man, like, it was, I, it was a buffet, you know, I get to exercise. No, actually, no, I couldn't exercise. They, I was, uh, it was explained to me that the, the exercise I was doing uh, compounded the aggression I had within me. So I, I, all I wanted to do was throw fists. I wanted to beat things up, right. you know. Uh, if, they, if I couldn't so, do that, I played tennis. But I was smacking the ball with such <laughs> venom, you know. Uh, they they actually you, they banned me from every sport. Like they every put time. you to slacklining. Well, they didn't know slacklining back All then, right? right? Um, but anyway, hey, you know what? That would be a, a great, a great one for. Well, we come to that, we'll come to that too. Yeah, you we know, can come to that. Slack, we can slack, come yeah. to that. Um, so, would you say that the um, the six months was the thing that really pulled you out from? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It, uh, I wouldn't say it pulled me out. It, it gave me some skills to deal with the, the, the uncontrollable rage. Mm -hmm. um, there was still a lot of work I had to do myself. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I still believe to this day that the hospital didn't, didn't cure me. They, didn't, they, they dosed me up with so much drugs um, cool. that I couldn't put one and one together. Um, I was numb the entire time. Uh, I was on a, a literally handfuls of psychotics, uh, antipsychotics every single day. Oh my God. Um, and it was unpleasant, you know, and the, mm. the thing that, that I came to realize was I, I much rather be in jail or, or dead than be numb like I was in that, that entire period of my time there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I took myself off it and I came well I'm, well, I'm glad that you what well, you kept all, you you had to. I had to, but uh, it was against the, the the doctor's advice. It was oh. um, it was very painful. The withdrawal symptoms were horrendous. Um, I was incap incapacitated for at least a week. I was throwing up. You know, you've, you've seen movies where people are withdrawing from cocaine or what was it, any type of hard drugs. You know, they're sweating, they're rolling around, they're screaming. That was me. That was me for seven solid days, and I was just throwing up all over my bed, and I was a basket and case. Were you then still uh, with wifey, or was she yep. alone? Yep, she was looking wow. after me. Um, what a woman! Yeah, she was an amazing human being, you know. And she saw me, um, you know, through the night terrors, the nightmares I have at night, um, waking up, punching her, you know, because I thought I was fighting the enemy. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm not, I'm not proud to say it, but I, I, I would beat my then wife in her sleep, thinking she was the enemy. It was a horrible, horrible period of my life, a period of her life as well. But to her absolute credit, she stuck by me until I was well enough to look after myself. Before she said, "I can't do this anymore." You know, both her and her father, you know, saved my life. And and if you were to to sort of like give another person in, in the same situation as you before um, some solid uh, advice. And, and I'm sure you do meet people. What would you tell them to, to do? What questions? Or Solid advice. Like I said before, it's, it's not my place to give anyone advice. But if somebody asks me what, um, what's important, important in my life is to find something greater than yourself to, to, to fight for. Right. No, how, about, how about when you meet that Dan Rick right now before going checking in himself to the, the clinic yeah. what would you tell him how about that giving your over self advice breathe just breathe just be just breathe things will turn out well okay um, I'm, I'm just going to dig in a little bit more into it um, so I think this is fascinating. I think a lot of people will get a lot of this. Um, do you remember what are some of the narrative you need to rewire or relearn just to adjust yourself back to society? Absolutely. I think that one of the biggest ones was that people don't owe me shit. Um, the general public don't owe me anything. They didn't ask me to stand up for them. They didn't ask me to, to dig the hole for them and sit in that hole for six weeks waiting for something to happen. They didn't ask me to, to go hungry all those times. You know, they certainly didn't ask me to sign my life on the dotted line. It was my own decision. Um, 
that was probably the one that, that I kept having, keep having to remind myself because I would often, um, even after coming out of the service, putting my uniform away, I, I just viewed civilians as some waste of breath, waste of DNA, you know, waste of potential. That's how arrogant I was, you know. And, and sometimes I even catch myself still slipping back into that narrative. And I have to say, hey, dude, you know, we're not going back there again. No, no, I said, no, you know, I have the same uh, narrative, but I think from a very diff- different angle, I was like, wow, I, I, I wish I can just tell you the answer right now. I've got to control myself not to tell you that. I'm going to lead you to it. Yeah. Um, so that, that's probably one of the things that kind of keep popping up. In, in, re- in relation to military service, at yeah. least, that, that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of um, different things that, kinda, that can pop into my mind mm. in relation to that question. And you and I are, I'm just going to do a left turn here. You and I are big on, on, on solo traveling. Uh, and I feel that, you know, traveling means different things to different people. Uh, so what have you gotten most out of, out of your solo trips? And, and when, when did you start it? I, I started shortly after I left service. I started doing volunteer work because I felt I was missing that, that mission in life. Okay. And so I started doing volunteer work in my community back in New South Wales. Um, and I found that it was very fulfilling and I kind of just expanded on it. So I decided I would not just help my local community, but I would help the, the you know, uh, the community abroad, people I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I, I picked Nepal as a random, uh, uh, random um, location. I signed up uh, as a, uh, one of those volunteerism thing, thinking I was uh, king shit and I was doing great, you know, saving the world. I, I'm going to look great on Facebook. With all my photos, and you do it, and you do, and I did, I did it. Yeah, I had all the photos to prove uh, how great I was in, when I was in Nepal. Doing, there was a lot of likes. Yes, lots of likes. You know, my ego was stroked the whole way through. I was feeling very good about myself. Shortly after, but uh, what I learned from that though is um, traveling is about people. Traveling is about a place. What, what I have learned about all the years I've been traveling is that the place is only as good as the people who make it. So when I say to you, I didn't enjoy a particular place, it's because those people will not allow, perhaps it's the wrong way to say, I have not learned how to connect with those people in that, in that location. I'm just very humble. Way yeah. Saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's what it comes down to. When I go to a place, it doesn't matter what, what place that is, you know, I always reach out in the best way I know how, which is the very Australian way. G'day, how you doing? I'm Rick. I'm from Australia. Be my friend. Let's talk. Uh, no? Oh, whoa, shit. Sorry. Okay. Too much? All right. That's cool. That's cool. Let's try, try something else. Um, and, and we talked about immediacy, you know. Um, I, I practiced it when I was in the army because when I meet a girl, when I'm still in uniform, I don't know if I'm going to be deployed the next day, the next week. Or if I'm going to go to work one day and come back with one less limb. So if I meet a girl or even a guy that I enjoy his company, I say, hey, let's, let's go for a drink the next night. I don't kind of mince around. Likewise, when it comes to traveling, you can practice that immediacy a lot more freely because travelers also understand that the time, the interaction you have with them is very finite. So that when you kind of jump in their face and say, hey, my name's Rick, g'day, how you doing? Be my friend. They're usually like, oh, look, we've got five days. Yeah, I can be a friend. I'm sick of you in five days. I can piss you off and start afresh, right? But therein lies the beauty because when you open yourself so freely and so openly and so unreservedly, magic happens. Magic happens, right? I love it. And, and this is where, this is where my, my community starts to build itself. Um, and I have collected a, an amazing community around me, an international um, family of like-minded kindred spirits. I love it. Magic. I'm just going to leave you at that. <laughs> so good. Um, and also, <laughs> I just want to go back to the time where I first met you, right? Uh-huh. Remember this day, great day in, in Melbourne. Uh, we went out, we did the whole dancing thing in, in the bar in Chinatown. We went drinking with your friends. And then, um, and then we did some stuff, and then we missed more people, and then we went back home. 
and you took off your vest mm -hmm. and got <laughs> and you have this right. huge knife behind your back. Yes. <laughs> and this is not well this is this is while you were dancing with girls. Yes. <laughs> so and I, 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 will you say that's a knife? I mean, how? That, that, okay, what's a dagger? Or, you know? No, that was it. Wasn't a dagger. It was my combat knife. Um, I've carried that throughout my entire um, operational life. Um, so, to explain to you why why that was and how that transpired was, for th almost thirteen years, I was never once unarmed. When I was in the service, I was every day carrying a firearm. Every day, every single day. When I'm not in uniform. I'm carrying a knife on me. Um, so when I left the service, suddenly you know, I no longer have the access to all these fancy new toys. You know, I felt so naked. I know I don't, I'm not in any imminent danger. I know, I know there's no, no IEDs out there. I know I'm not going to be set upon by a, 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 thug, a group of thugs with the machetes. However, I, just, I, was, I couldn't bring myself to step out the door not properly attired. And to me, being properly attired means having my full CES, combat serviceable equipment. Um, and that included um, a light, a, a light source, a fire source, a blade of sword, doesn't matter how large the blade is. In, in, the, in the case where you saw me, well, when you met me, it happened to be a really large um, combat knife. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I caught you on a good day. Yeah. yeah. And, and some electrical tape. And these are the, the things that I carry with me all the time. Uh, even now, um, obviously, I don't carry a knife on a plane, but um, um, you know, when I travel, but uh, I always have some sort of blade in my, you know, on my on my possession. Yeah. So let's let's talk about. Oh wait, wait, go finish your thought. But now, now I'm a little bit more. Uh, I've got a little bit more finesse. So you know, my martial journey has come a long way since then, and you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that I don't carry a knife anymore. But I do carry things that are less overt. I carry a pen, for instance, which can do just as much damage as any special blade. Pen. A special pen? Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a special pen, uh, but my pen is always special. <laughs> but it's, it's a user. It's, it's, a, it's a utility pen, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and, 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 and let's dive a little bit about the cargo pens. <laughs> and uh, we'll have you take it from here. What's, what's, with, the, what's with the pens? What sort of pen? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you have, you always, when I see you, you're always in cargo pens. Yes, so, it's, uh, it's pretty pathetic. I've got, I've got <laughs> zero um, fashion sense. My, my clothing pretty much consists of uh, sports shorts, uh, hippie pants, and cargo pants. Pretty much everything. Um, Has it got to do with any of the uh, hiding? Pretty much. Uh, well, not, not so much hiding. I, I don't cache anything. Oh, um, oh, everything I carry is perfectly legal. Um, with the exception of the knife, it's, it's perfect, absolutely illegal. Trust me, you don't want to carry a knife. Um, like I say, I, I carry a blade, but it's a lot more covert now. Um, I, and I certainly don't brandish it like I, you know, like I would. In fact, I wasn't brandishing it. I, was, I just had forgotten that you were there. Um, I, I completely slipped my mind that I have a random stranger in my house and I'm carrying a knife on my back. I, I think that makes a good story for me. Yeah, right? <laughs> but now I, I carry things like, uh, you know, um, a pen. Wherever my pen is. Yeah, let's look at this pen. Ah. I think I've taken it off um, okay. while, while we're doing well, the interview. What do, we, what do we have? What special stuff do you have today? At the moment, I've got nothing much in my pocket other than um, my wallet, but um, I've got my little torch here. Okay. Um, I often I will carry a small blade about that long just mm -hmm. for cutting you know, anything that you need a blade for. Yeah. My pen, believe me, the pen gets used all the time not, and not in the ways that you would imagine. Um, I'll always have a, a, a length of rope with me mm. and amazingly I use it all the time. Um, oftentimes I would also wear a, a what we call a survival bracelet which I make myself. Uh, on that you'll find a little flint which I can use to create fire with um, and sometimes with, if I'm going on extended trips you'll find that there's also a wire sort um, weaved into that um, um, bracelet. So, yeah, like I say, paratroopers were very imaginative. We can make a lot of funky stuff. Yeah, and I remember when I was going traveling, I come to you for, 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 for self-defense advice as well. So, well, you know, now there are a lot of um, this, uh, my, my female friends, Asian, small-built female, 
who are planning to do some soul traveling who are, who are scared of the ass. Um, so <laughs> what sort of uh, self-defense advice will you give to um, our female friends over here? That's a very good question. So a lot of schools that, we go, that you go to these days will teach you how to fight. What I teach people now is how not to fight. So if you have, if you, if you have to fight, you've already lost. What I teach people is um, fight psychology, how to disengage, how to identify um, a, 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 a dangerous situation, um, how to assess a battlefield, um, uh, how to conduct a battlefield assessment, how to disengage from a hostile environment, how to disengage with all the people that you need with you mm. from a hostile environment. So these are the kind of things I teach um, primarily before we get into the fist throwing. Because any monkey can throw a fist. I can teach a, 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 literally a chimp to, to, to throw fists and be very effective at it. But it takes life experience to teach how not to get into a fight. And if, well, if, if they don't have you as a resource because of geographical location, is there anything like uh, online or, or courses or things that they can find? Th there is. Okay. But... Um, there, be very cautious about what you learn online because it's like learning kung fu from uh, a mag, uh, from a comic book. Ah, okay. You the situation tested. Yeah, because whilst you may have the step by step procedure of what you need, to, what you do in a particular situation, what is missing in that con in, the, in that whole package is context and experience. Mm -hmm. So they that that instructor who may be very good at the craft and may be very effective in that particular technique um, is showing you that technique. You're not able to ask the questions that needs to be asked. You know? um, so be very cautious about learning from an internet source. Um, but if you do learn from a person, always speak to people who are from, from that community. Don't just randomly go to a, you know, a dojo and expect that you're so going to... So what questions should they be asking? First of all, talk to people in the community, from, your, from within your community, people that you know practice the art. doesn't matter what art it is. It could be a traditional martial arts. But if you want to practice an art that is practical um, and that, is gonna, that will get you out of trouble with minimal amount of training and, and application, you've got to do Krav Maga. Boxing, Krav Maga, or, or um, Muay Thai. And a bit of um, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, BJJ, a bit of ground fighting. Um, so these are the, the, what I call the Holy, Holy Trinity. With this three um, basic, with basics of this three um, code under your belt, you are a really difficult target to take down. Um, but if you become an expert at any of one, is, at any one of these three, you, uh, you have you stand a far better chance of um, surviving a hostile encounter. Okay, one weapon uh, to carry. Pepper spray? Yes, no. No, definitely not. Okay, okay because pepper spray, uh, under, under duress, you will never read the environment properly. Okay, if I pull up a pepper spray psh, right now, I'm going to get a face full of it, not you, because the wind's coming in this direction. Oh. Right? Um, which means I got to fight my way around to you, to the other side of you, to use it. All right, so never ever go pepper spray unless you are um, law enforcement and you're trained to do so. So don't even take weapons. Just no, no, no. Really I just didn't run. say that. I didn't say that. Yeah, absolutely, run. Okay. If you can, uh, if if you can avoid it, run. There's okay. no, there's no, no <laughs> loss of pride in running away. Okay. And let me share a little okay, um, yes. anecdote with you, if I may. I'll make it very quick. In my in my early days of travel, I was um, I was in a country in a yeah. developing country where I was harassed by a drug dealer. I was with a girl and she was um, Caucasian and so this uh, drug dealer decided that he would um, try and, you know, uh, mack onto her and obviously, you know, me being out of uh, service recently, I was full of bravado and ego. I took exception to it and I told him to F off and he had his own ego issue so he came at me, starts chest poking me. And I always walk around either with my at the time with my knife and a walking stick. And because I was in public, I wasn't going to pull out a knife. So I broke his ribs uh, with a very quick jab uh, into his rib, and I felt it crack. It collapsed, and he ran away. Okay, I thought that's the end of the engagement. I'm feeling pretty good about myself, you know. Strut away, 
a little bit later in the afternoon, I saw this guy again further down, um, you know, uh, somewhere in the city. And I knew he was waiting for me because he was staring at me and his whole body posture, his whole body uh, language was aggressive. And then I noticed something that in, in his hand that was hiding from me and he was tapping it against his leg like that. And I knew he was, um, I knew I, I would never have picked it up had he not been tapping it on, on his leg. He was nervous. He was tapping it and he was doing this. And then I realized it was shiny. It was a curved, long, shiny blade. It was a kukri. I thought, you mother, you, you have not, you've not had enough. I'm, I'm going to destroy you. So I pretended I didn't see him. I sauntered close to him. And as soon as I got close enough, I pulled out my own knife, which was the folding knife. And I just went to town on him. I didn't deploy the blade. I just grabbed his knife and I just started pounding him, pounding him, pounding him. And he just, he opened up. And he felt like a, a, a ton of shit because he wasn't expecting me to engage him. And out of the corner of my eyes, as I was pounding him, came two of his buddies. I thought, oh, here we go. It's on, it's on like Donkey Kong. I kind of broke contact. I pushed him aside. His friends came running, grabs him, grabs the knife, and then runs off into the alleyway. I thought, whoa, that was unusual. That's cool. All right. So I walked away feeling pretty proud of myself. All right. And I never thought about it uh, for another week. The next week, I was in the city, and uh, uh, I was meeting some friends in a foreign city. And as I was walking down the street, I saw a guy, a Caucasian, who was new in town. Because when you're traveling, you kind of notice all the uh, faces very quickly, especially when you've spent several months in that place. Mm. And so when I notice a, a, like a new face, I always make a note of it. And this guy was new. He was, he's been there for at least you know, a few days, but he's new. He's grinning at me, you know, and he's in, in a big American accent. and says, I know you. I look at him and said, no, and you don't know anybody yet. No, no. Asian people, we all look the same, you know. And I just kept walking. I said, no, 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 I know you. You're the knife guy. And I just went from yellow to white. It's like, nah, you, you're mistaken, man. I don't know what knife guy is. And I walked away. And, and he was, next to him was a, a local girl who was, uh, who, who then confirmed what he was saying. He said, yes, yes, I know you. you you're the knife man. And I kind of went from white to green and I felt like throwing up at the time because I thought, shit, I thought I did all this and I was not recognized because I was just blend into the background, right? No, the entire city recognized me. So, so she said, yes, you um, yes I know you're I know you knife, I know you knife man because you helped my sister. I said, help your sister? Fucking what? And then I recalled a week prior to the knife incident, uh, there was a guy on a motorcycle who ran over a woman with a, an infant. Uh, the mother was badly injured. The baby was very badly injured. And so I was rendering assistance to this mother and baby. And this, Nepali, uh, this, this random stranger starts chest poking me. You know, and, and I was, he was yabbering in, in the local language. I couldn't understand. So I shoved him back and said, fuck off, help me, or fuck off in English. <laughs> I, I, know, I'm, I had no idea if he understood me or not. Uh, but he yabbing on about something and then just disappeared into the crowd. I said, that's fine. So I went back to doing my thing. Turns out the guy I, I, I face palmed uh, and told the fuck off was the um, brother of the guy I just, uh, of the guy with the knife, the drug dealer. It was so I'm kind of thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to throw up at this stage. I've, I've just opened up a drug dealer. I've insulted his brother. And I'm pretty sure I have pissed off his uncle somewhere along the line. And the entire, entire city is going to come gunning for me. And they know you. Everyone knows me. Like random strangers. A white guy who just arrived in the city knows me. How, how does the local drug dealer not know me? So, that, so what does that mean? I'm living the entire time in absolute fear of my life. So why am I sharing this story with you? It um, goes back to your question what do you do in a situation when, when you have to defend yourself? Fucking run away, dude. There's no shame in running away. Just because you can, just because you have the skill sets to, to eliminate a hostile target, doesn't mean that you should. Because the cost is immeasurable. You have no idea how that's going to affect the, the, the situation that you're currently in. You have no idea the risk you can put the people you're, you're with 
uh, at when you when you decide to engage somebody like that. You know, I have just literally put the girl's life in danger because she's recognized now. My myself in danger, and all my party, whoever choose to hang around me, in danger as a target for for those bad people. So, moral of the story is, don't do drugs, or don't right. get into fights with drug dealers, or run away, or run away. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of moral story. A there. lot of moral yeah. story. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that that was a bit longer than I'd expected. But, yes. <laughs> no, that was a great story and a, a a good a good sort of antidote to cement the thought that you know when even if you have the skill set maybe the better decision is actually to walk away yeah absolutely so it took me uh, a number of lessons to learn uh, to to learn the, the hard way um i mean even after that very same fact i went I, i was back in australia and literally made the exact identical mistake um I mean, I, I won't go into the uh, specifics, but I, I, I had to be the hero. I stood up in, uh, for somebody who couldn't protect themselves, and and it became uh, hostile and physical. And I decided I want to test my my skill sets um, mm. with uh, empty hand, t- um, you know, in an empty hand confrontation. I and it turned out really bad for me. Yeah. Okay, let's do a side step and and talk about something a bit lighter. Yes. You're forty, forty year, forty one year old now, and you've got out the forces when you are thirty one, which means if you do the math, you live ten years, uh, a retired life. Uh, how are you enjoying it so far? Um, fantastic. Um, I'm loving it. Um, being retired doesn't mean sitting on a beach drinking pina colada and you know wearing a straw hat all day long and getting a nice tan, although. Sometimes you can't do that. It simply means freedom to do what you need to do in life. It 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 it's, it's it simply means giving yourself the the permission to do what you are meant to do in life. Um, be it painting, be it writing poetry, be it helping people. And I found that in the ten years that I I've been retired, the moments that I find I'm most fulfilled is when I'm serving others. Um, it doesn't have to be in grand. Manners like uh, doing work in Nepal or anything. It could be just you know helping a friend move move home. It could be um, you know just talking to a random stranger who was crying on a bench. Serving the community is what drives me, and that's what I'm most passionate about. And so everything that I do in life now is is to to make sure that I live that truth because it makes me happy. How how did you found out about that? Purely accidental. Yeah. Uh huh. Absolutely. Um, obviously, when I was in Nepal working in, a, in the orphanage, I had a great time. Uh, I didn't realize I was having a great time because I was serving. I just realized I was having a great time. I thought because I was traveling, I was in a different place, someplace exotic, and people were you know patting me on the back, and I was getting lots of likes on my Facebook page. You know, my ego thing again. Um, but. There seems to be a trend in all these little uh, things that I did. You know, mm. the things that made me most happiest was, as I say, when I was serving other people. And I just want to uh, dig into a little bit more about being retired. Um, how much money do you allo- allocate for yourself on a monthly basis these days? Um, how much do you think before, and how much do you actually spend? That's a very good question. Um, I I'll put it simply this way: I I'm fortunate enough to not have to think about what I spend. I can very comfortably, um, you know, swipe my credit card and know that I will be able to pay that debt when the bill comes. Um, so I don't think about how I spend and what I spend. Uh, because at the end of the day, money ain't real. It's ones and zeros in on a computer that, you know, that uh, one day will just go blank anyway. Mm. So enjoy life, you know. Spend within the means, um, within your own personal means. Obviously, don't go nuts and get a you know thirty thousand dollar credit card debt. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but certainly, don't hoard money, uh, and don't think of money as the the, the end. It's a vehicle for you to 
to realize your dream. That's it. But I'm, I'm a man of simple means. I, I don't I don't need big things. I mean, look at how I dress. Yeah. You know. No, also even even when you're here in Singapore, you're still crashing at a friend's yeah, place. At a friend's place, I still, um, I still stay at hostels. I, I still, sometimes occasionally, uh, stay in dorms mm-hmm. at forty one. It's because I choose to do that, not because I can't afford anything else. Yeah. And and would you say that if you were to be okay, was if you're being budgeted, right? How much would you budget for yourself a year to be to live like how you are living right now? Um, gee, I haven't, I haven't done a budget in over. I mean, just just a roundabout figure, like a month, right? How, how much were you? Think? Let me, let me have a good thing because that's a question okay. I never never thought about. Um, no, I just want to underscore the people. Maybe it's like, as yeah, a personal, 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 yeah. personal spending. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like not talking about rent or anything like that, right? No, no. Okay. Well, I, I haven't paid rent in over twenty years, so that's that's that kind of handy. Um. I, w- I would say I spend probably around um, personally about four to f- about four thousand dollars a month. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's not terribly much. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving to slacklining a little bit. Uh, I think this is one of those uh, hobbies that you took up during um, this um, free time that you have now, and um, you 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 casually told me that you'll be one of the first. In Australia, to be charging money to teach slack lining. Australia in Victoria, at in least. Victoria. Mm-hmm. In Melbourne, yeah. Yeah. How how did you how did you do that? Don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, purely accidental, Daniel. I think um, I I was I've been slack lining uh, uh, for a number of years now, and it started when I was traveling as well. I saw someone did it uh, um, out in the park. Uh, in fact, I saw it in Malaysia, Malacca, and I thought, how cool is that? That is the duck's nuts. I bet you I can do it. Um, and when I set my mind to something, I, I'm like a dog with a bone. I just don't let go until I get I got it. So I, you know, and I'm an expert at becoming an expert. So I kind of picked it up real quickly and it became a passion. It was fun, you know, and not just because it was fun, but because it 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 was a tool I used for meditation. You know, so I draw a lot of parallels when I when I meditate to when I slackline. Because when you're not centered and when you're not thinking um, about your body posture, there is no slacklining. You cannot slackline if you're not if you're not if you're not centered. So anyway, I was, I've been doing it for a while, and I was I was quite good at it, you know. And I was one of uh, a few people who who practice consistently daily, and so I get a lot of exposure. And people would you know often approach me, and 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 I would teach them what I know, mm-hmm. and so one day, uh, a mom uh, came up to me and said, hey, um, I'm, I'm so-and-so's mom. You've been teaching my son for the last hour, and I've been watching you, and you're amazing. Are you a teacher? Where's your school at? I said, no, I don't, but thank you. And they kind of planned, and she said, well, if you're not a teacher of slacklining, you should be because this is fantastic. And that planted the seed, and whilst I didn't really do anything with it, again, a long story short, um, through a friend of a friend, uh, a teacher from a high school came to me and said, um, I heard that you teach slacklining. What do you charge? I said, I don't. But since you want to pay me, um, let me uh, draft something up. So I kind of made it very nominal. I, I, I gave him, I, I sent him their the proposal. He accepted it straight away. And there, therein begins my first um, paid gig as an instructor. Um, and it turned out that his students were the, from the most difficult schools in the, re, in the region. So they were bad kids. And the first thing the teacher said to me is, please don't be surprised if the kids do not respect you and they will, they will be really difficult. I said, no worries, you know, there's nothing I can't handle. So they came and having a military background really kind of captures their imagination, especially when you tell them you've had combat experience. You know, and you know, I, I, would, I would often share anecdotes with them, the funny stuff, not about war service, but... You know, the funny stuff that we get up to in the army, they, they eat the stuff out, you know. And when you've got their attention, especially when you've got the alpha student's attention, the rest will just fall in the line behind him. So all you got to do is win his, win his trust. Mm. The rest is smooth sailing. Strategy. It is. And, it's, and, and that parallel can be drawn for pretty much anything in life, you know. You walk into a social environment, you, you feel a bit intimidated. 
pick the alpha out of the group, make friends with him, and suddenly you'll notice everyone wants to make friends with you. That's just the way it works. You know, it's, it's, it's pack mentality. And so anyway, long, again, long story short, uh, words gotten out. And so one school heard about it, the other school heard about it, and suddenly, you know, I've had um, a lot of uh, other offers for work like that. So I became one of the first few people who are actually paid uh, financial gains for teaching slacklining in Victoria. Yeah, and how does how does the uh, boys uh, receiving uh, slacklining? Um, the first uh, the first session will will always be difficult because the kids that are sent to me are always from the most difficult classes. That's why they have these uh, extracurricular classes, right? Um, but I I like to think that I'm pretty good at uh, kind of pulling men into line, and most of them are boys. I, I very rarely get um, girls in my classes. Sometimes, but rarely. Um, and what I've, what I've learned is 99% of the time, all they want is to be heard. All they want is to be acknowledged. As soon as you give them what they need, what they want from you, there's nothing they will not do for you. And so my job, as soon as I get them, is assess what it is they want from me. You know? And it's a bit of give and take. Sometimes they will try and push the boundaries of my, my patients. Mm. And I'll have to very quickly pull up my, um, my army hat and say, hey, boys, you, know, you, you, can, you can get away with a lot, but do not disrespect me because I will fuck you up 10 shades of blue. Um, but not in, not, not in those words. But they, they, I do sometimes have to pull them up very, very forcefully uh, because there's a lot of safety issues at hand. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't pay attention, not only are you risking your own safety, but you're also risking the safety of your peers, mm. in, which, and in which case it, you're risking my, uh, my safety and my, and my yeah. reputation as well. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where responsibility Exactly, yeah. Um, I'm just going to do a, a quick segue to one of the last question before jumping to the rapid fire right. question. Um, so you're 41, and uh, when you came in, you have a, a, a comment that you don't look like. <laughs> so uh, what are your routines for, for keeping yourself physically uh, fit? Um, I, I don't so much have a routine for physical fitness, but I, I practice my art um, daily, uh, pretty much seven days a week. Um, beyond that, not really. I, I used to run uh, five k's a day, but um, I realized I don't really, I can't really maintain that because my knees are shot, my back's bro- um, kind of busted, so it's causing me a lot of pain. So I dial all that back. Um, so now I'm practicing more for my cardio fitness than the actual vigors of combat. You know, for vigors of combat environments. So that's basically it. And that's my my martial arts and some stretching. Gotcha. All right, so a uh, quick round of questions. Um, um, what is the books or books uh, that you have given the most? Shantaram. Oh, okay. It's on the list. It's on the list. Uh, would you want to do a bit of explanation? On for, for sell, those, sell the people. Absolutely. Okay. For yeah. those who, who haven't read Shantaram, please do yourself a favor and do. If you're a traveler and you haven't met Shantaram, shame on you. Um, it, it's a book about, uh, it's not exactly a biography, it is a, fic- a work of fiction based on a, a person's real life experience. And this person is a Melbourneian who was a convict uh, who did some bad things, landed himself in jail. And through his escape to India um, after escaping jail, his life's transformation from criminal to what he was, what he ended up becoming by the people he met. And so a lot of his stories kind of resonated with me through my own travels. And whilst I don't exactly see myself in him, I see a lot of parallels in our stories. Gotcha. And uh, are there any uh, favorite documentaries or, or movie that you like to? I love Mr. Attenborough. What's he, it? Mr. Attenborough. Yes. Any Attenborough's um, uh, documentaries resonate with me. How, how do I spell his uh, name? Uh, Attenborough. That's a good question. A T T. Google that one. I don't. Well, uh, well, what are the, the famous work if, if you want to point someone to whoever's? Talking? I think I think it's one, uh, the, one of his most famous one is called Earth or Life. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a, a very beautiful um, narrator. I love all his documentaries. Uh, what have you uh, purchased um, under a hundred dollars that has most impacted your life? God, let me think. Um, most impacted my life. 
my pen, my pen I carry with me every single day. And it's very useful. And can I find it on Amazon? You certainly can. How do yep. I search for that? So my, my pen uh, is, is called a hardware. Um, what is it called? Is that the brand? Ha- no, it's called Hardcore. It's a hardcore pen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, you can, you can uh, Amazon it. You can eBay it. Uh, it's an Australian company based in Melbourne, uh, which is why I bought it in the first place. Okay. Um, but yes, it's a utility pen. Very heavy, writes beautifully. Okay, we'll just leave it as that. So also want to do more research, could <laughs> type in. What are some of the worst advice you see or hear being dispensed in your world? Ah, uh, okay. Well, I, I hear a lot of bad, bad advice coming from the martial arts world. Um, it, it's just full of it. Uh, I, I'm not saying I, I give the best advice, uh, but I certainly see a lot of bad advice coming from, from that part of the world, particularly uh, in relations to traditional martial arts. Um, some of the Worst one I see, I, I hate to say it, is from uh, the Sila community. There's a lot of mysticism associated. With, I'm not saying it, it doesn't exist, and I'm not saying you know that it's I don't uh, I I fool by it, but um, there's just too much hocus pocus um, with you know trying to boil water with your you know power from your palm that kind of stuff. You know, it's so. What, what advice would be, would it be if you focus on the water enough, the water will boil? Or? Yeah, well I. I guess that's what they're trying to sell. Um, if if you learn from their school, this is what you can do. I don't I don't know, but um, but I guess my advice is be very do your research, talk to people from the community. If you want to be what if you want to learn that art, if, if it's painting, whatever it is, talk to the painters who who are in the community. Don't just kind of go head first into whatever you want to learn and think it's going to be the ducks nuts and it's going to be the best. But and if you are actually in it. Start asking questions. Ask questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Always challenge your teacher. The second your teacher um, uh, uh, fubars you for challenging him or her, he's no longer your teacher. When you think of the word successful, who came into your mind and why? Mm. My mom. My mom is very successful. She's uh, uneducated, comes from a pauper, lives in a, in a shed with eight siblings, uh, with a father who abandoned them from a very early age, raised by a grandmother who, who knew nothing but curse words and uh, rubber plantations. You know, she's grown up from that to raising three amazing kids, me being one of them, uh, in a foreign country where she barely spoke the language when she got there. You know, uh, she scraped every cent together. Never felt hungry in my in my childhood. Never, we were we were dirt poor, and I didn't even know we were dirt poor. You know, and and so, but my education was always looked after. She went without all the time, and and now you know when I when you think of people who are successful, I I I picture my mom. Um, any advice for your twenty year old self, and. 30 year old self and place us where I at. Advice for my 20 year old self. Yeah. Take a breath, man. Don't, don't, don't let the ego talk so much. It's, it's okay because it will, it will make you who you are. It will, it will shape you to be, to who you, who you will become, but don't let it drive too much. Don't let it drive too much. Just sometimes. 30 year old self. Uh, Wait, so what were you doing it when you're 20? I was full of ego and I was throwing fists all the time. I was, ang- I was an angry little man. I was, <laughs> I was proving myself. I was trying to prove myself to the world, to my unit, to my, to my brothers. I was constantly fighting. Yeah. All right, 30. So my, in my 30s, I, I would say breathe. Just breathe and be calm. Everything will work itself out. And it has. And it's still working itself out. The most common misconception about you or your work? Uh, um, people think I shoot a lot of people or I get shot at all the time that's not necessarily true sometimes I have to say that, that I mean it's not like in the armies trust me it's nothing like it's 99% absolute numb braining, braining, uh, numb, brain numbing boredom with about you know 1% of absolute chaotic pandemonium Fear-induced vomiting acts of violence. 
are there any uh, asks or requests for the audience to food for thought or anything you would like them to do, a book you like them to read, places to be, or travel, get out there, see the world. Don't, don't go to the internet and think you can learn everything from the internet. You can learn a lot from the internet, yes. But it's like, like I said before, it's like trying to learn martial arts from a comic book. You will never be able to feel it until you own it yourself. It's like trying to go to a mosque or a temple and saying, I'm like the Buddha. I'm practically the Buddha. Because if you haven't walked the path, you haven't experienced the, the journey, it ain't yours. It ain't yours. So traveling is that journey. Traveling is what puts you on the path. And just to like, add another layer on top of that, um, I always tell people um, traveling versus going on holiday is um, when you're going on holiday, you know where you're going, but you don't know where you are. And when you go traveling, you don't know where you're going, but you know exactly where you are. Um, where can people find you or your projects on the interwebs? So if they're... Well, if people like to find out about what we do, uh, you'll find me at www.casd-australia.org. That's our website. That's where uh, um, uh, our foundation is found. Um, we're, we are based in five different countries, and, um, uh, and I'm, I'm one of uh, three directors in Australia. Correction, I'm one of four directors in Australia. What's up, people? It is over. So as usual, all show notes, links, books can be found on the website, Brian Victor, B-R-Y-A-N. Uh, if you have any misfits you'd like to hear from, or you know, feel free to drop in an email and tell me why and what you want to hear from them. Uh, thank you again so much for taking our time and you know, listening to this episode. I hope you guys have a fantastic week ahead. This podcast is brought to you by Autism. If you don't know already, research is concluding that sitting all day is terrible for you. There's this new health phrase going on. It's called sitting is the new smoking. So if you're like me, I went to Ikea and tried one of those self-cranking desks and uh, I can just foresee that it's such a pain. So with Autism, it has actually a motorized system in it that you put it on your tabletop and transform your table into a standing desk. So, and what's cool is that it's also intelligent. It tracks and actually coaches you to develop these new habits with a sensor and the smartphone apps. Model starts at 1350 So check it out at altizen.com to see which might be the right fit for you. And if you decide to get one, you can code MISFITS to get a $400 off Altizen immediately. Uh, offer is limited to the first 10 customers. So just shoot them an email and code MISFITS.